Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Rinka Gupta. I'm from Argonne National Lab. And today I will be talking about uh, Agile. So let's get started. This is our regular citation slide. Should you want to cite our work, please use uh, references from this slide. Coming to what we will talk about in this session, we will uh, first talk about Agile methods, especially in the context of small teams. I'll then talk about what Agile is, what Agile workflow is, what is the normal terminology in Agile, and what approaches, methods, tools that we can use to get started with Agile. So let's talk first about small teams. What is a small team interaction model? Small teams, as we know, usually consist of um, one or two senior faculty members or a PI and several junior members. The, the junior members might be postdocs or students, depending on the kind of environment. The roles of senior and junior members in a team differ significantly. A senior staff provides more stable presence to the project. They're going to be around for a long time, probably for the entire length of their career. The junior staff may be there for a shorter amount of time, maybe until they complete their education. Uh, the senior staff is the one that provides the vision usually and knows the overall goals of the project and can see the forest from the trees, but they very rarely have the time or the inclination to sit and write the actual code. It's mostly the junior staff that uh, does the code writing and knows lower level details. There are several small uh, challenges that small teams face. Uh, usually, small teams have an informal structure and therefore they have less clearly defined processes in place. And many times the processes that work for big teams or enterprise and industry environments, they may not really be suited for small teams. In addition to this, uh, small teams have a constant influx and outflux of people. Uh, there are newcomers joining in, newcomers have to ramp up quickly. And when they are ready to contribute and when they are done, uh, and ready to go, then you have to make sure that uh, you are able to retain all the information because they are the ones usually writing the code and that's a big challenge. So there are a lot of challenges that uh, small teams face. This slide out here shows a research team member life cycle. There is uh, some initial phase, initial setup phase, and then the team member starts ramping up. The ramp up time depends on the experience of the team member, how solid are the processes uh, in place in the team? Uh, so it can the, the ramp up time can vary considerably. The next phase is when they are actively working, actively contributing, which you see in the ongoing work box on the slide. And uh, when they are ready to exit, then there should always always be a, a ramp down uh, process. Uh, Usually when you have a student or a postdoc, you have a fairly good idea of when they might exit and therefore arrangements should be made uh, to, to have a replacement member so that their contributions can be captured before they exit. Once they exit and a new team member joins in, then this whole cycle is repeated again. One way to deal with this, the challenges that small teams face is to have checklists and policies in place. Checklists are essentially to-do items. On this slide, on, on, one of, on one side of the slide, what you can see is a new developer checklist, also called, as, also called as an onboarding checklist from the Tridinus project. Having a checklist is good <clears throat> because you are essentially documenting the process. And if you miss anything in the process, uh, then you simply go ahead and you can improve your checklist and, and in that way, you know, your process also automatically gets improved. Uh, you can have different types of checklists depending on what your team needs. You, of course, can have new, new, new hire checklists, but you can also have like code review checklist, development checklists, team behavior checklists, and so on. Another way to uh, maintain consistency is to have something called as policies. And... Uh, uh, we've put a link out here which points to the X SDK project uh, that has uh, community policies. And having policies uh, like X SDK ensures that there's not only consistency within the project, but uh, there, there uh, is consistency across 
an entire area of projects. In the case of X SDK, it's like the entire area of math projects. So that's uh, checklists and policies can be really effective in tackling some of the challenges faced by teams. So now let us talk a bit about what Agile is. So what is Agile and why does it work for small teams, especially when we talk about research environments or scientific uh, you know, environments? In, in the scientific environment, you really don't know when your work pattern might change, when you may, you may suddenly have a breakthrough and your normal routine might get disrupted. You may suddenly have to focus on you know, presenting new, new, new found results or you know, focus on publications. So if you have heavyweight techniques, uh, uh, you might that kind of those kind of techniques and approaches might not might not be very conducive for scientific teams. Now, what happens with agile is that if you're a small team, you can pick and choose what kind of processes you really want to adopt. You can figure out what is benef beneficial for your team, what is meaningful. And instead of adopting a wide array of processes that are not beneficial to you, you can choose and say that I want to focus more on improving productivity or productization, or I want to focus on sustainability. So you can actually choose what you want. Let's talk a bit about what Agile actually is and, and what it is not. So first of all, Agile, Agile is not a software development lifecycle model. It's not like your traditional um, waterfall model or it's not an iterative model. It doesn't have different phases that a conventional software development lifecycle may have. And many times I've seen Agile um, informally defined as a, or informally used as an excuse for not doing good work, for doing sloppy work. So if, Agile doesn't mean that you don't write documentation. Agile is not an excuse for sloppy work and that's not acceptable. Uh, there are certain people who consider Agile to be synonymous with Scrum. Now Scrum is a framework that helps team work together. It's very widely used in the enterprise industry. So Scrum is defi definitely Agile, but Agile is much more, uh, it's not just Scrum. There are other Agile methods that exist and Scrum is just one of them. Uh, and speaking of Scrum, uh, Scrum is very useful. It's a very good framework for people who, uh, who use it, but its applicability in scientific teams has not been explored much. And uh, people definitely use something that we call Kanban a lot more. And we will, we will talk about Kanban a bit later in the slides. So if you really want to understand what Agile is, go to this website called agilemanifesto.org and read the manifesto. The manifesto has four components that you can see highlighted in, uh, uh, in the first, in, in just above the red box. One, one component says that um, individual and interactions are more important than processes and tool. And you can see individual and interactions highlighted in bold. Another one says that uh, working software is more important over comprehensive documentation. Now, when such statements appear in the Agile Manifesto, it doesn't mean that Agile says that don't write documentation or writing documentation is not important. That's not the case because right under this four, four uh, components, it says very clearly in that red box, which is not placed correctly, it says that while there's value in the items uh, to the right, we have we place more value to the items on the left. So while working software is valued more in Agile, there is also a lot of value in comprehensive documentation as well. So if you are serious about Agile, it's a good idea to take a look at the Agile manifesto and these four components that you see highlighted out here and then the 12 principles that it has. And I think we have listed the 12 principles in the next two slides out here. We don't have time to go through all these 12 principles. So I'll touch maybe on the first couple of them. And uh, some of the important things are highlighted in red out here. The first principle says that our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through continuous and early delivery of valuable software. This principle is important because this is what Agile actually focuses on. When you're implementing software, the software has to be given to stakeholders. 
early and frequently, according to Agile. This is because a lot of older software development lifecycle processes have different phases and a lot of time investment was needed in designing, implementing, testing the software. And eventually when the software was ready, it was found that the working conditions of the software had changed. A lot of time has pa had passed and the target environments had changed and therefore the software was no longer a good fit. And there's a lot of force fitting that goes on to get that software working for stakeholders. And Ag Agile basically tries to circumvent this by saying that, hey, have the software for your customers as early as possible, as frequently as possible. Agile, the second line, the second principle of Agile says that welcome changing requirements, even late in development. So uh, this doesn't mean that Agile, so basically Agile does support changing requirements. It welcomes changing requirement, but it doesn't mean that any a stakeholder can walk in any time and say that, hey, here are my new requirements, change them. And it doesn't mean that uh, the stakeholder can do this repeatedly. It's important that Agile for, has a way to, to change requirements. Uh, but again, uh, again, go back to the first principle where it says that as time passes, code code. Uh, as time passes during code development, environments and requirements may change. So it's good to get those requirements into the uh, into the code base early on. So uh, some of these principles uh, uh, should not be taken verbatim, but the semantics behind them should be understood clearly for them to make sense. So this slide and the next one, as I said, has the 12 principle. And if you are interested, take a look at uh, all these principles carefully. A lot of uh, items are highlighted in red out here, such as um, uh, uh, sustainable code development or uh, team reflecting on how to become more effective and maintaining a constant pace. So on, these are all excellent principles and worth reading. Uh, if you're serious about Agile and if you want to understand what it actually is. One thing that I want to point out about Agile is that these 12 principles are not hard and fast rules. The uh, What Agile tries to say is uh, do not follow a rigid framework that is force-fitted, that is ill-fitted for you. Uh, if you follow a rigid, instead of following like a rigid framework for a long period of time, and that will ultimately just annoy and frustrate you, it might be good to investigate some of these agile practices and adopt them if they are suitable. And uh, how, how do you do this? One way to do this is basically to sit with your team and figure out some agile practices, see what your team likes with what resonates with them and try out that practice. And if that, those practices are not helping, then, then, then you sit down again and try out another practice. And if they help, then that's great. One thing I want to mention about, uh, one thing I definitely want to mention again is Kanban because it has worked for a lot of uh, teams in the scientific domain. And we think that Kanban is a pretty good starting framework. You can start with the basic principles of Kanban, which we'll discuss in the upcoming slides. And then you can add practices whenever you think you need more better practices. Following something like Kanban is, is advantageous and uh, is more advantageous and following something like as compared to following something like Scrum, which sometimes may be very force-fitted for scientific environments. The slide out here shows basic Kanban, it shows the basic Kanban board. When, uh, when, one th when I think of Kanban, I think of it as a very, very, very um, com uh, complex or sophisticated, that's the word, sophisticated to-do list. And uh, I always like to say that if I could map all the tasks in my project that are there in my head, if I could map them to a board, it would, it would look exactly like what you see on the slide out here. Every, um, uh, every project has a lot of tasks and those tasks can be segregated into columns and uh, the columns will look like what you're seeing out here. You'll always have a backlog column You'll always have a list of tasks in progress you, that you see in the in progress column. You'll always have a done column that is a list of things you've accomplished. And then you can have other columns uh, such as uh, 
uh, tasks under review or tasks uh, that are in the uh, being in, uh, uh, in in a pre-publishing state and so on. When it comes to labeling the columns of a Kanban board, you can be as creative as you want. And out here are a couple of examples that students have used where they have columns title, waiting on advice or confirmation. And, and and blocked for advice or input and so on. So it's up to you as to how you want to design your Kanban board. Kanban does have certain principles that you for, that you should probably pay attention to and follow because they're useful. For example, how many tasks should you have in your in progress column? In progress column is fairly co common in Kanban in Kanban and in, and on Kanban boards. So one example is that one of the principles is that uh, you limit the number of tasks in your in progress column. In progress column, in progress means that the tasks have been actively worked upon, and they are uh, and they are of course specific to each team. But sometimes the recommendation is that you, if your team, if you have n number of team members, then you limit the number of in progress tasks to two n minus one. Having such principles is good because if you have too many tasks, then your team members are going to spend a lot of time context switching than actually making progress on the tasks. So how do you how do you optimize flexibility versus um, swapping overhead, context switching overhead? How do you make sure that your team members are not overcoming committed? Things of this sort become easier to address when you have some rules assigned to your in progress column. One uh, one good thing about Kanban boards is that it is very, very good at exposing bottlenecks. So if, for example, if you have um, a column, if you're, a, if you're a student and if you have a column that is blocked, um, waiting for um, feedback from uh, different people, from different collaborators, and if that column is full, then you know what your, what your bottleneck is. The bottleneck is basically not getting uh, input on time from your collaborators. And of course, when bot once bottlenecks are identified, then it's easier uh, to fix them. Therefore, Kanban works very effectively in R&D settings because it doesn't have a deadline-based approach. Uh, you deal with the deadlines in a different way. Uh, so tools like Scrum have deadline-based approach and, and that becomes a problem. Kanban is therefore a very a nice and elegant way for viewing tasks, for managing your issues and ensuring that you continue to make a progress at a steady pace. This slide shows a few examples uh, of, or, of resources and, and states that Kanban doesn't have to be just for your work life. You, they are very much, uh, the principles are very much applicable to your personal life as well in exactly the same way. I use Kanban to manage my personal life on a daily basis. There's a very good book listed out here called uh, Personal Kanban. And uh, that's, a, that's a good read. I've listed a website, uh, which is a better scientific software website. It's labeled bssw.io and that has a bunch of articles on team productivity and um, uh, individual productivity and Kanban for productivity and so on. So we've learned that Kanban board is very simple and it's essentially a set of columns put together. You can name the columns what you want and you add your tasks there and, and define the columns as you see fit. How do you get started with Kanban? What tools can you use with Kanban? If you want to get started with Kanban right now, then you could simply use your wall with post-it notes. You could use a whiteboard, blackboard, whatever, whatever works well for you. Of course, but in addition to this uh, uh, very simple basic tool, there are more sophisticated tools that you can use. And there's a lot of software available for Kanban. For example, there is uh, Trello uh, that many people use. And then there's Jira that are used in, uh, that is used in the industry as well as in several research environments. And of course, if you are, uh, you, if, you, if you use Git, then you, are, you must be familiar with GitHub. And GitHub lets you create tasks and uh, create issues. Basically, the tasks are called as issues. And it lets you create project boards. And project boards are, are actually just Kanban boards. 
In my personal life, I use Trello uh, on a daily basis. I have a Trello board for my private life. I have a Trello board for my work life. I have a family Trello board and so on. Trello is a software that is freely available for Android, iPhone, iPad. And uh, you, can, you can use it and add and create tasks to, to manage several segments of your life. And you can choose to have different kinds of boards for different uh, contexts. And you should, therefore you should try Kanban and see, you know, start playing with it and see where you, where you go with it. One big issue is um, a question that gets asked is, how many tasks should I have on my Kanban board? Is that too many tasks? Is that too little task? Uh, there's no single answer for that. I would say just, just choose something and adjust from there. I started with a couple of, I started with like 10 tasks maybe a couple of years back. And now I think on my Kanban board, I have like six columns and maybe 50 tasks. So uh, the freeway analogy is very applicable out here. And which is basically asking the question, does the traffic really flow um, fast? Does it really flow, flow optimally when there are a lot of cars? And the, the answer is no. Uh, the same thing is true for how effective you can be. If you have a board full of tasks, it doesn't mean that you are going to be more effective. That's something to keep in mind as you add more and more tasks to the board. Also, one more thing I should point out is that when people get started with Kanban, they get started with a lot of enthusiasm. And, uh, uh, and, and the thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, for enthusiasm to be sustained, you have to make that thing into a habit. So you have to make it a habit to consult the board on a regular basis and figure out that this board will help bring in focus how well your team is doing, what the bottlenecks are, how much free time your team is having, what each person is doing and so on. It will help, it'll help enable reflection, retrospection, and it will definitely improve productivity if you use it on a regular basis. If you think you are dropping out of the habit of using Kanban and you haven't looked at it for like a week or a month or so, and that and that's totally fine. It happens to all of us. And instead of uh, uh, instead of reflecting too much on it, you should just go back and reanalyze the board and restart the restart the uh, restart the habit. Let's talk a bit about the importance of in progress um, concept. In our audience, we have many students, we have many young professionals who are starting their career. And you may wonder that this the, that is Kanban of any use to me? And the question, and the answer to that question is yes, Kanban is definitely of great use to you. If you have your own Kanban board, you can very clearly see what items are in progress, what items you have on back burner. Let's say you have many, many things that if you're a student and your PhD advisor has given you many tasks to work on. And if some new technology comes in, new research comes in, and you want to work on that, if you have a good and systematic Kanban board, uh, you can, and you have a clear picture, uh, using the Kanban board, you can have a clear picture of how much time and bandwidth you have. And once you have a clear picture, you can talk to your advisor and neg negotiate and convince them to move tasks to the back burner so that um, you can focus on things and work that really matter to you. So Kanban board will help you improve your efficiency and use your time much more wisely. Now that we have discussed basic Kanban, let's talk about how we can build on it. There are several common things that we can do to build on Kanban. The focus should always be on resolving issues, solving issues. One way to build upon existing Kanban is to have regular um, 15 minute stand up meetings where people report their progress on different columns of the Kanban board. Of course, you can have planning meetings, you can have retrospective meetings uh, where you, you know, and you can have like uh, all different kind, kinds of meeting. In retrospect, for example, retrospective meetings are a great way of figuring out what you've done on the project, what things have gone well, what things have not gone well, and so on. Now we should take a quick look at the concept of epic story and task and then and see where it fits in, in, in on your Kanban board because epic stories and tasks are used in research as well as in enterprise environments. The idea of epic story and task is that you start with the high level requirements and then you break down and refine them only when you need to and if you need to. The reason for that is 
uh, a lot of time can be spent in refining requirements. And many times it happens that once the epic or story or task has actually started, some of the defined requirements may quickly become outdated. And therefore, a lot of planning time that was invested in defining them is actually wasted. So the recommendation is that if you need to define requirements, do them closer to the start date of the individual elements. Now, uh, among epic story and task, among these epics are high level objectives, very high level requirements. If you refine epics a little more, then you get stories. So an epic usually has a couple of stories under it. A story has a done criteria, which is understandable by the user. It provides a lot of value add to the customer. A story in itself can be broken down into tasks and you can think of tasks as a steps that are needed to complete a story. And the tasks themselves may or may not have to provide any value to the stakeholder, but overall you need them as a part of, the, of your process. In terms of hierarchy, epics, you have epics, epics have multiple stories, and each story may have multiple tasks to complete that story. And once you mark all the stories done, then that corresponding epic um, is marked done. One way to define epics and stories is uh, to have user stories. And what are user stories? User stories are something that make it very easy for your customers and teams to actually understand. Usually the format of a user story is that as a team lead, um, for example, okay, as a team lead, I want to, um, uh, I want to learn Kanban so that I can, I can manage my team better. Now, this can be a requirement given to a development team, for example, um, uh, you know, if a development team is uh, developing training resources or uh, productivity resources. Given, giving such a user story helps um, the stakeholder as well as the development team to understand what the overall context is. And it, asks, it helps the development team to uh, get additional information about what high level requirements there, uh, there are and it helps them to fulfill the goal a little more efficiently. So this slide has some more examples about um, how user stories can get defined and what kind of message uh, they, send, they can send to stakeholders. This slide shows a quick example of a Kanban board from uh, the Collegeville School website. And you should explore this example because you can, uh, you can see how Kanban boards work in real life. It's a good, good example for inspiration. We have a lot of GitHub users out, out, uh, out here attending the tutorial. And one thing to mention, as I, I mentioned this previously, but I want to bring it again to the forefront that uh, GitHub does provide support for basic Kanban boards. It doesn't have a lot of features, but the advantage is that Kanban boards are very simple, especially with GitHub and the learning curve is small and therefore it's very good uh, to use for small teams. And so if you are already using Git and GitHub for your development, then the Kanban boards are definitely um, worth exploring. This slide shows a bunch of tools for you to actually uh, explore uh, and see, and you can understand what the actual Kanban practices and how it applies for your, for your team. And this URL out here will take you to where all, you know, this bunch of tools are stored. And this is the final slide out here that I've put. There's a, there's a bunch of more useful resources for you to get started uh, on your Agile journey. So I hope you, uh, you uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. We'll be happy to answer questions.